Welcome to the Legally Speaking Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Hanna. This week, I'm delighted to be joined by Jake Shogger. Jake is the founder of the Commercial Law Academy, an e-learning platform for aspiring commercial lawyers, and also the founder and CEO of the City Careers Series, a publishing company offering a comprehensive range of resources relevant to the recruitment process for a range of city careers. Before all of this, Jake worked as a trainee solicitor at the Magic Circle Law Firm, Freshfield. So a very, very warm welcome, Jake. Thanks so much, Rob. That was a great, great intro there. Really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for taking the time to speak to me. It's our absolute pleasure. And before we dive into all your amazing achievements, um, both from a legal and entrepreneurial perspective, uh, we do have a customary icebreaking question here on the Legally Speaking podcast, which is on the scale of one to 10, 10 being very real, what would you rate the hit TV series Suits in terms of its reality? <laughs> Some bits are 10 when it's always dark outside when they're still in the office. Other bits <laughs> probably, probably one where you see them with this tiny little file that solves an entire case, whereas that would probably be a room full of documents and all sorts of online uh, online uh, portals. So I guess five would be an average between one and 10, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's actually what I gave it when I was asked uh, a little while ago. So good stuff. Okay. <laughs> So I always like to start at the beginning. So tell our listeners a bit about you, your family background and, and upbringing, firstly. Sure. So I uh, went to a state school um, at the age of 18 when all my friends went off to university. I thought, no, I'm going to be a rich and famous rock star. So me and uh, three of my mates made a go of it as full-time musicians. We got a very small record deal, had a great time touring the country for uh, five years and releasing an album. But uh, as you, you can probably guess by where I am now, that didn't quite uh, work out. So... The ripe old age of 23, decided to go to university, really enjoyed business A level, so chose business and wanted to combine it with something else that didn't involve numbers, which I was afraid of at the time. Um, so law and business, I picked kind of by default, um, started law and business at Warwick and ended up looking at loads of different city careers, but um, eventually went down the, the commercial law route. I did a four year degree, so I was trying to put off real life for as long as possible. Took an extra six months off after the LPC and didn't start my training contract until I was 28, which I'm actually really grateful I chose to do it that way around. Um, and as I mentioned, kind of st spent a couple of years in the city. I qualified as a lawyer, quit the city, uh, and now I do this whole mix of stuff, some of which you've, you very kindly mentioned. Um, I'm still a practicing lawyer. I do maybe five to 10 hours of legal work a month through this awesome boutique firm called Ignition Law. It's very much focused on startups and scale ups. Um, but the majority of my focus now is not on being a lawyer. Yeah, and it's, it's a wonderful background and I'm, I'm really fascinated to dig into a little bit more because before working as a sort of legal advisor, career coach, you worked at Freshfields. What was that like and what was the main lesson you learned during your time there? So I think I'd expected to be working like 23 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the year. You've got all the, this reputation of kind of magic circle firms and big US firms. And it honestly wasn't like that. I mean, I had times where I was working till four or five o'clock in the morning and had to come back into the office the next day by nine-ish. I did work a, a few weekends, but it was a lot more balanced than I'd expected. Um, and I still had the time to have a life. Um, it is very unpredictable. And I think that's the same with any large international firm. The biggest, the bigger problem is not the hours. It's not knowing when you're going to be busy and not being able to commit to things. So um, that was, I think, the thing that I found hardest to deal with. I just didn't have any control over my time. Um, the people were, were awesome. It wasn't competitive. And I'd expected it to be super competitive between everyone. But actually, it wasn't like that at all. So the culture was nice. And some of my best friends today are people I met during my, my training contract in the LPC. I learned a lot. I learned a lot more, actually, than I think I gave the firm credit for at the time. It's only on reflection I realized how much I picked up in terms of communication skills and um, being professional, organizational skills, balancing loads of different things, and just having the kind of knowledge and, and, uh, and confidence to try and figure stuff out, which is what I now have to do on a daily basis. So loads of positives there, um, and that's, that's kind of how I found the experience. Brilliant. And so considering you changed, you touched on it, but considering you did train at probably one of the most renowned firms in the world, why did you make that big transition out of private practice into everything you do today from advising startups and, and beyond? 
Great question. It's a question I think some of my friends from uh, from back in the day are probably still asking. But uh, I, I kind of I got to grips with my own priorities during my training contract. Um, my son was born towards the end, and that definitely influenced it. But I touched on this earlier. I think control was something I realized was a lot more important to me than than I'd maybe thought in the past. And it's nothing to do with work life balance. I work far longer hours on average now than I ever did in the city. But if I want to take a couple of hours off on a Tuesday morning to take my son to the park, or if you know I know England is playing Germany in the Euros and I'd like to be in the pub for 4.30, I can make that happen, even if it means then working a 14, 15, 20-hour day the next day to make up for it. And, and that, that I really love. The second thing was impact. So for some people, impact is working on a deal that makes the front pages of the Financial Times with billions of dollars at stake and all this confidential information about really famous high-profile companies. And that's totally fair enough. It's a matter of opinion, and that is impact in its own way. For me, firstly, I wanted to be closer to where the commercial decisions are made. You know, I found myself sitting there doing legal work thinking, I would love to have known what happened in the room at that company or that private equity firm that led to the decision to go ahead with this acquisition. Um, so it was partly that and partly me wanting to see more clearly the impact of what I was contributing as an individual. If I was one of 50 lawyers around the world working on one side to get a deal over the line and there were accountants and tax advisors and all these different people, I found it hard to identify my personal impact. Whereas now I work with startups, the client is usually the founder who I'm working directly with. If I help them to raise money, I can see how that has made a huge difference to this business. So even though we're talking hundreds of thousands of pounds as opposed to billions and companies that most people have never heard of, I get more satisfaction from the fact that I can see my impact and, and kind of I feel like I'm journeying these, joining these companies on the journey. So, um, you know, I think running my own business on the side also gave me that constant flavor of what it's like to run something in a creative way and in a commercial way and kind of make those high level decisions. So I constantly had that comparison during my training contract. And, you know, that, that, was, that was something that um, stuck in my mind and kind of led to me eventually making the jump. Yeah, and I just love the word that you mentioned there of impact. You know, I, I say to a lot of people, whatever you're going to do, make sure you have a purpose and make sure you know what your impact is that you really want to make. So, yeah, really, really enjoyed that. So, as I mentioned at the start, in 2014, you did found a publishing company called City Careers Series. And Amazon recently recognized your training contract handbook as a number one bestseller in the law category. So tell us a bit more about the company. Sure. So um, I wrote or co-wrote a number of books covering the kind of commercial awareness, case study and employability aspects of the recruitment process for City Careers. So um, it was great seeing the training contract handbook being listed um, as a bestseller because it was my latest book. It only came out in November. Uh, my commercial law handbook is now listed in kind of the top 10 career books on Amazon and it's top for law. Uh, and, and that's really wonderful. And that's not why I started it or, or anything like that, but it's been really great. So Commercial Law Handbook is very much about what I needed in my commercial law interviews when discussing M&A case studies and law firm focused case studies and that kind of thing. Friends that have been similar uh, through similar processes to me, so internships, open days, all that kind of thing. But in banking and consulting, helped me produce similar guides for those sectors. I then produced a guide to writing applications, preparing for interviews and internships, you know, motivation questions, competency questions. And that was based on you know, all the knowledge I picked up mentoring countless students over the years when that kind of started towards the end of my degree when I gave up time with colleagues of mine to to run CV clinics for, for more junior students. Um, I then wrote uh, an LPC revision guide with my wife um, during the time off after the LPC and we've been developing that over the years or I have now um, she doesn't really want to work on it with me <laughs> and uh, a uh, business writing book with the guy that came and trained us on the LPC. And then the, the more recent one I mentioned, the training contract handbook, that's sort of everything I learned during my training contract and beyond as a practicing lawyer. Like when I was a student, I found it really hard to understand what a trainee lawyer actually does on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's what I wanted to show. So I go into a fair amount of detail on the types of documents that trainees negotiate and what the clauses are and the key negotiation points. I talk through in detail the processes that trainees tend to manage. I give loads of tips around soft skills and organization and the stuff that we were taught to, to kind of improve ourselves and, and professionally develop. Um, and I thought that would be really helpful for students and then people doing internships and also um, people about to start their training contracts. So um, that's where the thought process came from um, in terms of what I've written and published. Yeah, and I, I love that, that, you know, all of that inspired you with the City Career Series guides. You know, have you always had that passion for writing? No, not really. I mean, essays terrified me at university. It was it was all started totally by accident. So 
I, I think going to university a bit later, I went into overdrive when it came to trying to get a job. I went to dozens of open days. I took avid notes for everything I did, internships, after interviews, all of that. So I had dozens of pages of Word documents of all of my notes that I've been developing. Um, and I thought to go along with those CV clinics and a commercial law focused society I co-founded, why not put it into a consolidated document and just give it out to students for free to help them out? And a couple of the society sponsors said, well, look, we will, we're happy to sponsor that if it gives you some cash so you can print them. So that's the first time I even thought of it being a book rather than just a Word document of notes that I sent around. And then got really good feedback that I hadn't expected from the students that did come um, to read it. It made me think, oh, there's a bit of a gap in the market here for very focused um, commercial awareness, especially from lawyers facing case studies on concepts like M&A that you're just not taught at law school. Now, I've read Chris Stokes' books, which are beyond excellent, and it's such a great starting point, books like you know, know the City. Um, but I thought people might want to then delve into more industry-specific detail and, and understand how that fits into the interview process. Um, every aspect has been trial and error. You know, I wasn't a writer before that. Um, my mum used to comment on how bad my written English was when I was 18 and trying to send professional emails on behalf of the band. But um, it's something that's developed a lot over time. So, um, yeah, it's, it's something I do really enjoy now. But I do also love doing webinars and lectures and podcasts and something where I'm actually getting to interact with other humans, whereas with the books, you're a little bit further away from, from the end, end reader. Yeah, no, absolutely. But it's wonderful work that you have been doing. And I know it's greatly appreciated by the community. OK, so we have to talk about the Commercial Law Academy because, you know, this is something else you founded last year. It's an e-learning platform for aspiring commercial lawyers. Why did you decide to create the platform? And can you just tell us a little bit more about the Academy? Sure. So, um, again, it was slightly by accident. It wasn't like a strategy I put in place to pursue. I started doing webinars back in September. I thought it was a great way to interact with people. I couldn't do all the in-person presentations I used to do at universities. Uh, and the webinar software had a record function. So I thought, why not record this content I've been developing for a number of months just in case I need to use it in the future? And I soon got to the point where I had I don't know, 10, 12, 15 hours worth of video content and all sorts of relevant topics. Uh, and I realized that that took um, the content in my books to a whole nother level. I then thought, well, what can I do with this video content? Do I upload it as on-demand webinars? And then I found great software that lets you build online courses and also introduce interactive elements such as commercial awareness quizzes and practice psychometric test questions and downloadable e-guides and all this stuff that you just can't do with, with books alone. So that's what made me start building it. For years, I'd also had so many emails from international students where the shipping costs meant the books weren't really accessible or they might need to wait weeks if there were courier delays. So an online course meant instant access for people, um, which was something that I thought would be, would be really helpful as well. So it was all of that stuff coming together and the fact that I had just had all this content, having been asked to produce content on so many different topics over the last few years, that it seemed like a bit of a, a, bit of a no brainer. Yeah. And what a roaring success. And I guess. How can people or individuals enroll in the academy if they're interested? Sure, if they just go to www.commerciallaw.academy, um, you'll get loads of information on all the courses. And it's just a kind of one affordable monthly subscription that lets you access absolutely everything. And then I supplement that with kind of monthly workshops, subscriber only, where I might kind of go through a CV live or answer people's specific questions. And again, just to try to keep that direct introduction with with the people that are involved in, and make it a success. Fabulous. OK, and you are someone with a big following on my favorite platform, LinkedIn, and I'm waiting for them to hopefully roll out their audio um, features in, in the future. And your City Career Series has a dedicated LinkedIn community of well over four and a half thousand aspiring commercial lawyers. However, the platform can seem daunting to those starting out. So what advice would you give to aspiring solicitors who have just started on LinkedIn or are thinking of doing so? I would say get used to using it well as soon as you can, because even if you can't see why it will be directly relevant to where you're at right now, if you get in the habit of using it properly, that can benefit you right away through your career. And it has done so for me. Um, mindset is, is a lot of it. So if you think of LinkedIn as a bit like sending your CV out to everyone around the world every second of every day uh, and nothing is hidden, hopefully that will persuade you to put the same effort into keeping it up to date and using it as you would do if someone said, can you send me over your CV? You know, if, if, if someone says send over your CV, you might have an initial moment of panic and think, oh, have I put that, have I put that skill on it or that experience from last week? Oh, no, I need to update it. Is the formatting right? 
you, know, you need to be thinking about LinkedIn like that all the time. And as soon as you do something interesting, stick it on there because you never know when someone else is going to look at it. Um, recruiters might look at it. Graduate recruiters or partners before they interview you might, might give it a cursory glance. Um, and people in your network as well. It's a great way for them to get to know you. So show yourself off. I mean, all of this reflects on your personal brand, your skills, your experience. You might put up photos or articles you've written or web links to, to prove that you've developed certain skills or picked up certain experiences that you're talking about. Um, you know, it's a lot more interactive than a CV in that kind of way. Uh, one bit of advice I would say, and I'm sure Rob would agree, um, working recruitment is make sure your headline captures your experience and what you're looking for. Um, so often I'll get loads of ads from readers and subscribers and webinar attendees, and the headline is my first impression of that person. So if the headline is blank, I might just think, oh, this is a cold, a cold ad from somebody who's going to try and sell me something. Whereas, you know, if it says second year law student or management student, then I know it's probably someone that's interacted with my, my resources and, and might be looking for, a, for extra advice. So use that well. Um, finally, get in the habit of publishing content and engaging with other people's content. I mean, this can help to ensure people in your network actually remember who you are. And if people in your network remember who you are, then they might see an opportunity and think, oh, that person could really benefit from this. I'm going to tag them in the post. Or um, there are so many ways that that could be invaluable throughout your career later on. So um, those are probably my top tips for LinkedIn. Yeah, some really, really good tips there. And absolutely, the headline is so, so important because that's the most instant thing people are going to look out. So it has to be catchy. OK, so following on from that, when applying to law firms, how can individuals be more proactive in reaching out to associates or partners of those particular firms? Is LinkedIn the right or wrong way to do it? Sure, well, I think... It's, I mean, proactive suggests that you could be reaching out to hundreds and hundreds of people, you know, throwing mud at the wall and hoping something sticks. It's, it's more about being clever in your strategy if you're trying to connect with people who you don't have a link to. So, I mean, that's essentially cold outreach, reaching out to someone who doesn't know you and you have no link to. And if you do that in a clever way, you're much more likely to get a response. So one thing you could do is use filters on LinkedIn to find people that have some kind of shared experience with you, you know, something in common with your backgrounds and then reach out to them and tell them explicitly why you've reached out to them. You know, maybe they were part of your Sunday league team when you were a teenager, or you go to the same choir, or they went to the same university as you a decade earlier, and now they're where you want to be. Because if I receive a message from someone saying, hi, Jake, you know, like you, I studied law and business at Warwick, and like you, um, I've, I've written a book on, on the city process, you know, I could really appreciate some advice on that. If I receive a message like that, I know for sure that person has, has reached out to me specifically, they've done their research, and they want me to reply. If I get a message that I can tell, and you can normally instantly tell this, that that same message has gone out to hundreds of people, it's just too easy and tempting to ignore it because you think that person hasn't put any time in. Why should I? And there's so much spam these days, people are naturally suspicious. So that's one way to reach out to firm representatives via LinkedIn that might actually work. If you attend a presentation or a panel discussion and there's a firm representative speaking, if you want to connect with them, add a message to that connection request and tell them that you saw them speak and that's why you're, you're connecting. Again, it kind of reduces that suspicion and makes it more personal. That aside, it's a lot more effective if you can to get direct introductions or warm introductions from people that already know you. So LinkedIn might help you to connect the dots. If you have a friend who will happily speak to you, you realize through LinkedIn that that friend is connected to someone at a law firm where you really want to, to um, gain some kind of insight. Say to your friend that, please, can you email me and that person, stick us in the same chain, make an introduction. And that's always going to give you a better chance of, of getting a response than reaching out to someone unilaterally and totally cold. In terms of mindset, expect rejection and expect wasted time. Don't take it personally and understand that that's totally normal. If you send a personalized message to 10 people and three of them respond, that's a fantastic response rate for cold outreach. And actually, you might only need one person out of 50 to get back to you for it to totally change the trajectory of your career. So stay positive, glass half full, realize people get rejected or ignored all the time uh, and just stick with it. The final point is don't ask for too much. People are busy, they are potentially stressed. So requesting a five minute coffee and stating exactly what you want to achieve from that coffee will probably go down much better than asking for you know, a, a one hour meeting or just sending someone a long application to review. You know, Just respect their time and show that you appreciate anything they're willing to give you, even if it's only a few minutes. 
Some really, really good tips there. So yeah, I just urge people to take action on them. Um, so thanks so much for sharing that, Jake. Okay, so you often hold free masterclasses and webinars. So can you tell us the types of things you discuss at these events? Sure, I mean, it's a whole range of topics. I've got uh, masterclasses on writing applications and that focuses on kind of how to talk about your competencies, how to draw competencies out from your experiences. And I, I do a kind of live exercise where I take experiences and give loads of examples of the types of skills you can draw out. I talk about motivation questions as well. Um, I did my first webinar on psychometric tests um, last year, and I'll probably be doing another one of those in the autumn, kind of talking through live examples of questions and why the answers are, are correct or incorrect. Uh, I cover internships, prepping for assessment centers, virtual assessment centers, um, practical networking, uh, more commercial ones on M&A and uh, examples from my interview case studies. I've recently started covering negotiation. Uh, and then every month I run a current affairs webinar with um, Peter Watson from Watson's Daily, where we cover the kind of legal business and markets insights from, from the last month. And, and a lot of this stuff, or it's all free now. So um, please do check it out. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Loving it. Okay. So what would you say are the top three skills needed to be a successful future lawyer? The problem is when you ask a lawyer for a list, you're always going to get a longer list than you've asked for. So I'm trying to be pragmatic with this, but, um, but I, I think the classic competencies uh, will still be hugely important for junior lawyers. Uh, and, and these include things like attention to detail, organizational skills, and communication skills. That's something I needed on a daily basis during my training contract when you're um, you're trying to create technically proficient and accurate work, you know, no mistakes. You're balancing lots of different deadlines for lots of different people. So time management is key. You're communicating with junior people, senior people, clients, grad recruitment, HR. So communication skills are key. And I, don't, I just can't see that really changing. Research is important, analytical skills as well in that domain. Now, these skills evolve throughout your career. So networking is likely to become far more important as you get more senior and you're expected to start bringing work into the firm and, and building relationships with senior people in the firm's network of offices. I mean, a lot of the time, that's absolutely essential to somebody being made up to partner because lots of senior people need to vouch for them. Similarly, I mean, leadership skills, I don't think are that important for a trainee unless you're leading teams of paralegals, but that will become a lot more important once you're senior enough to become a supervisor, for example. In terms of like a, a successful future lawyer, I think one of the key new skills that people will need to have um, is, is just a general understanding and, and confidence when it comes to using tech to automate and improve processes. Um, I don't think you're going to need to be some kind of genius coder, but you need to be open to the benefits technology can bring and, and be willing to, to get stuck in. So um, yeah, I'd say in a nutshell, that wasn't really in a nutshell, but that's, that's <laughs> my advice anyway. A lot of advice. We'll take that. All, all very practical and helpful tips. So I appreciate that. And on the topic of tips, then, before we look to, to, to close, what are your top tips for future lawyers when answering motivational and competency-based questions in, in interviews? Sure. So I think uh, in terms of motivation questions, like one of the key things firms look for is a passion for the business. Now, I hated these questions when I was a student. I always thought an ex-firm already knows they're market leading. Why do I need to waste my own time doing loads of research? just to kind of tell them what they already know. It just didn't seem like a good use of time. But then I realized, actually, it costs firms a fortune to train you. And therefore, you don't start adding real value until long after you've qualified. So firms want to know that if they make you an offer, you're going to take that offer. and You're hopefully going to stick with them in the long run. Now, the hypocrisy uh, or the irony isn't lost on me that I left straight off the train. <laughs> I did my research and I answered these questions properly. But it's important that you put the time in. So... Yeah, if you're talking about career motivation questions, so why do you want to be a commercial lawyer? Tell your story. You, know, you could start by explaining what sparked your initial interest. And you know, was it a conversation you had at school, at university modules, an insight from a career fair, something like that? Um, explain what it was that you learned and why that appealed. And then explain which next steps you took to explore that interest further. Because if you say you know, uh, scenario A happened, that really resonated with me. And therefore, I took these active steps and, and had this experience, it's kind of adding authenticity and credibility to what you've said in the first instance, because why would you have applied for an open day if you hadn't legitimately thought that the conversation you had at a career fair was interesting? So draw on all of the experiences that have helped to reinforce your interest in the profession. And then don't forget to draw out what you actually liked at each stage. If something might have given you exposure to the international nature or the client facing nature, um, the focus on team working. Your academic study might have uh, 
cause you to realize that you really are attracted to the problem solving nature or using language to mitigate risk um, uh, and all that kind of stuff. So just think about your personal journey and, and that can help to make an answer a bit less generic. Uh, the absolute key here is relating answers back to yourself. In terms of firm motivation questions, you know, fine, you convinced us you want to be a commercial lawyer, but why do you want to work at this firm in particular? You need to be very specific. Do your research and try to find factors that do in some way distinguish the firm. Talking about rankings and deals and awards can veer into the generic because most firms or most big firms have won some kind of award or done some kind of large deal or something like that. Um, Looking at the structure of training can help. Firms do tend to have nuances. Some firms have shorter rotations. Other firms might offer guaranteed international secondments. Some might have sort of academies where they bring in external speakers. And, and talking about that and why that matters to you um, can help to, to form a good firm motivation question. You might talk about pro bono or CSR initiatives if the firms are, are doing something that actually resonates with your own volunteering experience or your own values. That can be quite personal. Talking about culture is a difficult one, but if you've had a conversation with someone from the firm or watched a video when someone is talking about culture, then maybe name check that person, quote what they said about the culture and explain why you think you'll thrive in that environment. Because that shows that you've researched the firm, because you've taken the time to speak to someone or maybe watch one of the firm's um, resources. So that can help. Saying that, if the firm has done some kind of work or worked with certain clients or jurisdictions that truly does align with your interests, um, then that can be okay to talk about. You know, I have mentored students that have a massive interest in shipping. That's backed up by them doing a master's in shipping and a shipping qualification and all this kind of stuff. So they're then applying to a firm with a focus on shipping and they talk about um, the great work the firm does in that area. I think that's a lot more personal and that can be um, fair enough. But the important thing, again, relate whatever you're saying back to yourself uh, and just think if you could you know, cut and paste a different firm's name into whatever you're saying, then it's probably too generic. Um Final part was competencies, right? Yes. So on that sense, the biggest mistake I, I see is people forgetting to give context. They'll say, you know, as treasurer of law society, I've developed skills, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And they're assuming that the person reading that application knows what the treasurer of the law society actually does. So if you are talking about a, a competency in the context of an experience, explain what the organization is, explain what your role involved, and then talk about the skills so that the person reading it can, can follow your thought process and go, okay, as treasurer, they negotiated sponsorship with firms. So yeah, they probably have developed networking and negotiation skills. Um, they've run large events, so they probably have developed project management skills and, and, and ability to think innovatively. Just that little extra bit of detail can make a really big difference. I would also say don't focus only on professional experiences. It's totally fine to talk about sport, music, dance, theater, whatever else you're interested in, because you can get so many great skills from these. And I talked a lot about music and running a five-a-side team and my involvement setting up a society. I didn't just focus on my legal skills. And that helps to show that you are maybe a little bit more well-rounded um, and you've acquired skills in loads of interesting ways. So um, yeah, that's probably, probably what I'd say, say about that. Amazing. Yes. Yeah, really, really valuable shares there, Jet. Really appreciate that. And if people want to follow or get in touch with anything we've discussed today, what's the best way for the, to do that? I guess feel free to shout out any web links or relevant social media, and we'll make sure we also share with this episode for you. Sure. Awesome. So um, please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn, but remember to leave a message so I know why you're connecting with me and you're not trying to sell me some random stuff. Um, join my LinkedIn group for aspiring lawyers. I'll pass on the link to that um, to Rob. Please follow Commercial Law Academy on LinkedIn and Instagram and Facebook and everything else. Um, and do check out citycareerseries.com for more information on my books and commerciallaw.academy for more information about the online courses. Uh, thank you so much, Jake. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show and wishing you lots of continued success for your career. But from all of us on the Legally Speaking podcast, over and out. Awesome. Thanks so much, Rob, and keep up your great work on LinkedIn. I really enjoy following your posts. Thank you. That brings to a close our season four of the Legally Speaking podcast. We have produced over 100 episodes since our launch two and a half years ago. We have loved every minute of our journey. We want to thank all our loyal listeners and followers for all your help and support along the way. We are already busy planning our season five. We have a number of amazing guests already lined up, inspiring content, and lots of new additions to add to the show. 
If you haven't already, we'd be truly grateful if you could leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. That would mean the world to all of us here at the Legally Speaking Podcast. Please do keep an eye on our website and social media pages for updates on Season 5. But for now, over and out. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Legally Speaking Podcast. If you enjoyed the show and want to help support us, remember to leave us a rating and review on Apple iTunes. You can also support the show and gain exclusive benefits, bonus content, and much more by signing up to our Patreon page, which is www.patreon.com forward slash Legally Speaking Podcast. Thanks for listening.